And welcome, Hoosier fans, to another episode of Podcast on the Brink, your weekly dose of Indiana University basketball news and discussion. I'm your host, Jared Morris. Podcast on the Brink is a joint production of the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. For complete coverage of IU basketball, visit assemblycall.com and insidethehall.com. Hi fans, this is Don Fisher, the radio voice of the Indiana Hoosiers. IU football tickets are on sale now for the 2018 season. Indiana hosts seven home games this fall in newly expanded Memorial Stadium. Don't miss any of the action as the Hoosiers take on the Cardinals of Ball State, the Virginia Cavaliers, and five Big Ten opponents, including Michigan State, Iowa, Penn State, Maryland, and the Purdue Boilermakers. For ticket information, visit IUHoosiers.com today. Go IU! On this week's edition of Podcast on the Brink, Alex Bozich and I continue our off-season look back at Indiana's championship teams. We've talked about the 1940, 1953, and 1976 teams, and this week we are going to focus on the 1981 championship team, the fourth for Indiana, the second for Bob Knight. And to do that, we have Kent Sterling with us. Uh, Kent, of course, the host of the Kent Sterling Show on CBS Sports in Indianapolis on weekdays, and he was a freshman at IU in 1981 and comes on to share with us what it was like being on campus at that time, to share some insight on the team, what made Landon Turner such an important, explosive uh, part of that Indiana team's turnaround, what made Isaiah Thomas so great, the relationship between Isaiah Thomas and Bob Knight, and why the way that Bob Knight and, and the coaches treated students and taught the game of basketball has actually been, as Kent said, the gift that has kept on giving uh, for many, many years since. So all of that coming here on this week's edition of Podcast on the Brink. Before we get to that, just a few quick words about our sponsor, SeatGeek. Whether you're headed to a baseball game or to a concert this summer, or maybe you're just anxiously awaiting football season, SeatGeek has you covered. SeatGeek is the smartest easiest way to get tickets to every type of live event, whether you're searching for a last-minute deal, planning a night out, or need to find the perfect gift, SeatGeek helps you find the best seats at the best prices, and it's all fully guaranteed. There is nothing quite like being there in person, and SeatGeek will get you closer to the action for great value. SeatGeek is designed to make your ticket buying experience easier than ever, which is why I use SeatGeek, and I've used SeatGeek to buy Mavericks tickets. I've used it to buy concert tickets for my wife. It's always the first place that I go, uh, because what SeatGeek does is they search multiple ticket sites and grade every ticket based on value, and that helps you immediately identify the best seats that fit your budget. It just makes it a really easy, painless process. So the, the best part for you, for Podcast on the Brink listeners, is that you get $20 off of your first SeatGeek purchase. So just download the SeatGeek app and enter the promo code BRINK today, B-R-I-N-K. That's promo code BRINK for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. SeatGeek, life's an event, we have the tickets. And we are joined on this week's episode of Podcast on the Brink by the great Kent Sterling, host of the Kent Sterling Show, weekdays at 3 o'clock on CBS Sports 1430 in Indianapolis. You can also subscribe to the podcast, which I do and I recommend because you get individual interviews in your podcast feed, a format that I absolutely love. Uh, And Kent, it is time for me and Alex to turn the tables on you, and we're the ones asking the questions now. <laughs> uh, this, this is so much easier than hosting my own show. This, I look forward to this. Well, and we're going to talk about a subject that you love and that you have intimate knowledge of, because as we've gone through this off season, we've done episodes on the you know previous championship teams, 40, 53, 76. So we want to talk about the 81 team. Um, and you, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were there on campus when the team won in 81, correct? I was a freshman that okay. year. And really, that was kind of my indoctrination into Indiana basketball. Prior to that, I went to high school in New Albany, and so I kind of kept track of IU, but I was mostly a Louisville guy, and then coming to Indiana, all of a sudden, that, that, that you're just immersed in it at IU, as you guys well know, and yeah, that became the love. Yeah. So I thought it would actually be useful to start this conversation by going a year earlier and talking about the 7980 team. Because that's, you know, it's kind of one of those teams, the diehards obviously remember, but a little bit lost to history. But that team finished, or, you know, started the season number one, finished the season number seven, and you only got 14 games out of Mike Woodson and Randy Whitman and really kind of set the stage for the 81 title team, didn't 
that's exactly right. And if you talk to a guy like Ted Kitchell, and I did over the weekend, just happened to see him socially, and we were talking about the 81 team. He mentioned that the 80 team was actually better, that that was a better basketball team, and that if Mike Woodson had been healthy throughout, that team had a better chance to be really, really good than the 81 team did. So when you look at the 81 team, one of the things that makes it so interesting is – that team really, really struggled <laughs> early in the season. You know, yeah. they had, I think, nine losses, or no, on January 22nd, they were 10 and seven after a home loss to Iowa. And I'm assuming that at that point, not a lot of people were thinking this is a potential national championship team on campus, right? It was kind of interesting in that you knew they were going to be good. You knew that they had the, the, the players, they, they had the raw elements necessary to create a really, really good basketball team. You just wondered if that switch was going to flip and what was kind of the the lever that could flip that switch. And then you, you mentioned that Iowa game. From that point on, they were really pretty good. They lost to Illinois, I think. They lost to Purdue at one point. But other than that, they really played good basketball, and they they sort of gathered this momentum that made you think when when we had to buy, we had to make the decision to buy regional tickets if we wanted them. Because those were uh, those two games were held the regional finals at Assembly Hall, uh, you know. Okay, what are we going to wind up seeing? And and you thought, okay, they got a good chance. Kent, I was uh, not born uh, when the 1981 uh, team won the national championship. So, uh, kind of like the '76 team and the, the team before that, you know, I'm uh, kind of trying to soak up as much knowledge on these teams as possible, and you know that. Growing up, I can remember seeing the Sports Illustrated. I think it was with Isaiah Thomas on the on the cover, and everyone always talked about how great he was. But one thing I, I've kind of learned is this team was much more than just Isaiah Thomas. Who, in your mind, were were two or three guys who really kind of made things click after they, you know, Jared talked about uh, the point where they were ten and seven, and then it looks like they only lost two games after that point. Who are the guys that really, besides Isaiah, that that you really remember fondly and kind of made this team go? This team really started to play and really started to click when Landon Turner started to click and started to play. And if not for the accident that he had the subsequent summer, I think that we would be talking about Landon Turner in the same way that we talk about Isaiah Thomas today. That two things really happened for that team. Number one, Bob Knight realized that it was Isaiah Thomas's team. And when he turned Isaiah loose and let him kind of run the show, that team got really good. Isaiah is a really smart, was a really smart basketball player, understands the game at a really high level. And he knew Landon Turner and he got the most out of Landon Turner. You, you also had a really unique situation with the guys on the bench. They were The seniors didn't play a gob for that team other than Ray Tolbert and Steve Risley a little bit, but you had really smart basketball players like Phil Eisenbarger, Glenn Grunwald, who were very talented, and they brought kind of this attitude to practice that I think was very helpful for guys who were in their sophomore year like Isaiah Thomas, Jim Thomas, uh, Randy Whitman, uh, Ted Kitchell. Those guys, I think, responded to the senior leadership, but it was night turning the kind of the keys over to Isaiah and then Landon kind of the switch going off and all of a sudden they got really good where they had great role players at all five spots they had a good backup point guard in Jim Thomas they had a kid named Tony Brown they had a guy named Steve Risley coming off the bench and doing a lot of good for that basketball team in sort of unheralded ways Risley couldn't score at a real high level but what he could do was set great screens, play terrific defense, and be a member of that team as it coalesced into a championship unit. You mentioned, you know, they really only had Ray Tolbert uh, as a senior that that made a ton of on-court contributions. How rare was it back in that time frame to have a team that was so young be able to accomplish such a great thing? Uh, you know, because it's not like it is now with you, you got these teams like Kentucky and Duke that are built around freshmen. This was a team with a lot of really good sophomores obviously a junior Landon Turner that was able to win a national championship. I have to think that was somewhat rare back in that time. It was very rare for a guy to go to the league early like Isaiah did after his sophomore year. That was really rare and experience meant a lot. But I, I think Indiana had that level of experience, but they also had kind of a, a, a youthful exuberance as well. And every guy on that team was really, really smart. I mean, that 1981 team might've been the smartest basketball team that I've ever seen. And, 
And the, the thing that I think was really unique, not just about 1981, but about the Knight era in total, was how generous Knight and the staff and the players were in teaching us the game of basketball. Um, when you were at Indiana during that era, you know, Bob Knight would hold little symposiums. Steve Downing came over to Briscoe where I lived and, and they had like eight millimeter or 16 millimeter film where we watched practice tape and that kind of, and that was just for anybody to show up and watch. You learned the game and learning the game during that 80, 81 season was, was really a unique opportunity to sort of see the evolution of a basketball team as it happened right in front of your eyes. But it, you're right. It, experience critical. And uh, Indiana, they had experience. But other than Tolbert, you didn't really see it, uh, you know, in game situations. You didn't see the benefit of that experience on the court. Those opportunities to learn the game that you talked about. Uh, I mean, obviously, that was big for diehards like you that love basketball, but did that have any kind of impact on getting students more excited about the team or kind of rallying around the team at all? Was that important I, from that perspective? It did, and, and I think it's really it's really one of those things that has been the gift that's kept on giving. You know, there were guys at IU during that era who became high school basketball coaches, who, who became youth basketball coaches, who have been Indiana fans throughout. And so you've got a bunch of guys who are very, very well-educated basketball fans. And that's one of the things that's got to be considered as, as people hire to that position as an Indiana basketball coach. You've got to be able to out-coach your fans. And I think at Indiana, that is, uh, that's a challenge at a level that just doesn't exist at many other places because Knight and, and his assistants and the other people in that office really did a good job of coaching us up. And I, I think that it's one of the reasons that high school basketball and youth basketball in the state of Indiana has been so successful for a long time. And, and this state has been such a kind of a home for terrific basketball players is the, the level of knowledge that was imparted by Bob Knight and those who worked for him. I want to linger on a few of the players for a minute, you know, because I think especially for, for guys like me and Alex, you know, who, who weren't born at the time when this team played and you see the clips of the old teams. But, you know, it's one thing to watch clips of a guy, but it's another thing to have seen them play game in, game out. You know, it's like the appreciation that we have for what Yogi did and how he grew and developed. You know, you, you kind of only get that over time. And so a guy like Landon Turner We've all heard about the legend of Landon Turner, you know, and you know that he was on the all tournament team, but then you look at his numbers for his career, seven and a half points, 3.8 rebounds. All right. But everybody talks about what a monster he would have been in a senior as a senior and how the, you know, the, the switch flipped. So what was he like as a player and what, like, what does that mean that the switch flipped? What was he like before and what was the difference in how he performed on the court after that? He was, I don't know if docile is the right term, but there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of grit to him. He was obviously very, very talented, physically gifted. And, and until he decided to kind of become attitudinally a different player, he, he just was, he was just kind of there. And as a freshman, and as I, I saw him play in high school and he, he just kind of existed on the floor. There wasn't a lot of competitive oomph to the guy. And, and then all of a sudden, late in that, that junior season in 1981, he got really, really good and started to compete at a level that made Indiana a completely different team. And all of a sudden, you, you could use different matchups defensively. And, and Bob Knight, at that point, had a team where he could switch guys and he could play guys in the pivot. Risley could go defend on the pivot. Landon could come out and defend a three. You could really create matchup problems for opponents because Landon Turner was keyed in and able to do things athletically, which he had always been capable of. But then all of a sudden, attitudinally, he just became really, really good at it and started to compete at an exceptionally high level. And, and that was that moment. I was talking to Ted about it over the weekend. And, and Landon Turner's just one of those guys where all of a sudden, boom, let's go. And he did. And, and it's just such a shame that, uh, you know, we were only able to see that for such a brief window because of the accident the following summer. Kent, looking at the roster, uh, the hometowns of every player, uh, one thing that really sticks out to me is you have one guy from Florida, then everyone else is from Illinois and Indiana. And, you know, one thing that I've kind of 
since starting inside the hall in 2007, you know, there's a lot of people from that followed uh, the night era and, and kind of, you know, his peak years and, and, and they long for getting the best players in the state of Indiana to the program again. Do you think this team is a, is a prime example of kind of why some of those fans feel like they do about keeping the best players and the best players from this part of the country home? I really do. You know, and the guy from Florida, Jim Thomas, had ties to Indiana. His his yeah. mother and father, I think, both went to school at Indiana. So there was nobody outside this two-state area that was on this team. And if you go a little bit further, uh, you know, Todd Meyer came in. He was from Wisconsin. He had Mike Giomi from Ohio. But for a long time, you know, Bob Knight didn't have to fly to recruit. And and when you get Indiana guys, and, and people outside Indiana kind of don't get this, but Indiana guys understand basketball at just a deeper level. And, and so I think when they get on campus as freshmen, they can really play basketball as a sophomore or junior would. And, and when they're seniors, they're kind of ready to coach. I mean, you look at this team, you, you look at a guy like Isaiah, who's been a GM and a coach. You look at Glenn Grunwald. He's been a uh, GM. The year before, he had Mike Woodson, a longtime NBA coach, Randy Whitman, another guy who's been a terrific NBA coach. And, and you see kind of the depth of knowledge that this group of guys had. Eisenbarger could have coached. Kitchell could have coached. You got a, Ray Tolbert's been a coach. You got a lot of guys who, who understand the game at a high level. And, and that happens in Indiana at a level that it just doesn't happen elsewhere. And, and so recruiting Indiana is, is, I think, and it remains really, really important. And if you lose guys like Gary Harris to Michigan State and Zach Irvin to Michigan, you're missing out on opportunities to build dynamic basketball teams, not just because they're physically gifted, but because they understand the game. And, and the level at which people play youth basketball in this state it continues to be kind of withering. I, my kid, when he played, he was playing 250 games a year. If you do something for that long, you know, we talk about 10,000 hours necessary to gain, uh, you know, kind of that, not confidence, but an elite level of understanding of any task. You do it for 10,000 hours, according to Malcolm Gladwell or whoever. You, you kind of, you know it, you have, you have developed a, a serious and deep expertise in it. And that's what happens in Indiana, and it doesn't happen everywhere else. And that's why in football, it's you know, in Texas and Florida, they're playing football like that. Here we play basketball like that. And when you look at that team, Glenn, Glenn Grunwald was a terrific high school basketball player in Illinois, a four-time first-team All-State guy. You know, you had Whitman at Ben Davis. You had, uh, you had Ted from around here. You had Ray from Anderson. You had Landon from Tech. You had a lot of Indiana guys who all came together at the same time and, and sort of figured out and, and were able to speak the language of basketball in a way that only experts can. You mentioned uh, earlier the intelligence of a guy like Isaiah Thomas. And look, we know he's one of the greatest basketball players who's ever played, incredibly skilled as well. But the other thing that you always hear about Isaiah is his competitiveness and his toughness. And I, I'm just curious, how did that manifest itself on the court? And how did that impact his relationship with Bob Knight, do you think? You know, I, I think that finally Isaiah won, right? To me, that's what happened when Isaiah was a sophomore and Knight finally said, okay, you know what, it's your team, you're right, you run it, let's see what happens. I mean, they started the season in 81, 80, 81, 7 and 5, and, and Knight said, all right, you know, let's try something new. Uh, Isaiah Thomas's toughness, when I was a high school senior and he was a freshman at Indiana, I remember Indiana playing against Kentucky, and he went up against Sam Bowie in transition. Sam Bowie is seven one guy who wound up being, you know, a top three pick out at Portland, and they took him instead of Michael Jordan. So that's what he was thought of as a, a collegian. Isaiah went up, and I don't know that I saw Isaiah dunk more than this one time, but Isaiah went up over the top of Sam Bowie and slammed it on his head. And, and I thought, oh, well, that's a tough thing to do, you know, and this is a tough kid. And, and Isaiah was all about, you hear stories, some that can be told and some that can't be told, about him gain, gaining an advantage in whatever he was competing at. And, and always devoted to winning. 
And, and in basketball, he did that at an exceptionally high level. And he was surrounded by a bunch of guys who absolutely appreciated him for it. When you talk to people about Isaiah Thomas, especially in Indianapolis, and guys who knew him, media especially, who knew him when he coached the Pacers, you get a very different description of Isaiah Thomas than you do from guys with whom he played at Indiana. Those guys with whom he played at Indiana still consider him a really close friend and one of the best guys they've ever met. Media here, they sing a completely different tune to the point where you think you're talking about two different people. The people who went to Indiana with Isaiah and competed with him absolutely loved that guy because of his toughness, because of his single-minded determination to win basketball games, and obviously because I think he's made those guys a lot of money because they don't win that championship without him. You know, going back to, you know, you kind of talking about how Isaiah won, you know, and Coach Knight kind of turned the team over to him. That always strikes me as interesting because it sounds like such an uncoached Knight like thing to do, given his stubbornness and his pride. I mean, we don't often think about the humility of Coach Knight. Do you think that was a sign of his humility as a coach in that moment, or was he just exasperated with a talented team and didn't know what else to do? I think even more than, than he, more than he thought of himself as a coach. He wanted to win basketball games, and I think he knew that that was the way to get that done. And and when he coached, especially when those teams were good, so let's talk about in in my era when they were good was kind of 80-81 through like 92-93. What he would do late in the season is all of a sudden, instead of being the teacher and the taskmaster, he would become the coach. They learned the lessons. Now it's time to exploit those lessons it's time to win games with those lessons. And he became a different guy and a much more patient guy. And, and, and a lot of times we kind of get lost in the anger and the diatribes and the kicking of shins and the head butting and the choking and all that stuff. And, and correctly so in some cases. But what Bob Knight was at his core was a great basketball coach, maybe the best basketball coach who's ever coached a game. He took teams, I mean, as recently as the teams he had at Texas Tech, those teams didn't have players. And he won a bunch of games and went to the NCAA tournament. When he was at Indiana, and when Indiana as a state was churning out really, really good high school talent, and he didn't have to go to Texas or Florida or California to go find guys, that team, those teams were really, really good and so incredibly well coached that it, it's, uh, yeah, I think that that's what we long for as Indiana fans, right? We, we want to see Indiana not just beat teams, but we want to see Indiana outthink teams and outscheme teams. And we haven't seen that in a long time. But man, Bob Knight could flat out coach, and he was all about winning. And winning in 1984 meant, here are the keys, Isaiah, go win us a championship. Ken, as we get ready for another season of Big Ten basketball, and the product to me is somewhat watered down based on the addition of some of the programs that have been brought in, Rutgers, Penn State, Nebraska, maybe even Maryland to an extent, uh, they're obviously a program with some tradition, so I think most Big Ten fans are a little bit more accepting of those programs than some of the others, but looking back at what the Big Ten was then compared to now, how much more difficult was it uh, for a team to navigate the regular season uh, when you had such a, you know, such a small amount of teams, you didn't have, you know, the single plays and everyone was playing each other. How much more difficult was the Big Ten back then as opposed to now, do you think? Well, you had to play everybody twice. You did have at that point, you had Northwestern team that was always terrible. You had Wisconsin at that point under Steve Yoder, really always, almost always terrible. Minnesota, uh, they weren't too bad with Kevin McHale and a guy like Randy Brewer. Um, it, it was a well-coached league, um, but I I wouldn't say yeah, Ohio State was really good, especially during that period of time with Clark Kellogg and Granville Waiters and Troy Taylor and a bunch of really, really good players. Um, Michigan obviously got good toward the late 80s. I'm just running through in my head uh, those teams and what they represented as far as challenges I think actually the Big Ten's tougher today because I think it's better coached. You know, you've got guys like Beeline and and Izzo and uh, Chris Holtman and Matt. You know, you, you got really good coaches in the Big Ten. I think actually, and I, I 
concede your point completely. Rutgers is terrible. They're likely always to be terrible. Uh, Penn State's never going to be great. Maryland, uh, Maryland occasionally gets really, really, really good. Uh, but I think that the core of the Big Ten is actually better today. And, and I think that people have figured out, like, uh, recruiting isn't regional anymore a- as much as it was. So you got programs like Michigan State and Michigan coming into Indiana, Illinois to an extent, and, and kind of strip mining some of the best players because Indiana's program over the last 15, 18 years just hasn't consistently been kind of that, you know, destination point for high school seniors. Uh, I think it's an interesting question, but I would, I'd say that it's actually, I'd say top to like from one to 10, the big 10 is better today. And then the bottom four, yeah, you can, you can go get a win at those places more often than not, if that makes sense. It, it was a lot. I like the double round Robin. I like playing teams home and home. I, I wish that they would end uh, a lot of the exhibition season and just kind of play 26 conference games. I think that'd be, that'd be more entertaining for me to be better basketball. I think it'd be more fun. It's interesting that you say that. Um, I was actually in the building the last time a Big Ten team won a national championship in 2000, Michigan State. What do you think then, you know, has been behind maybe the, the league's drought? This, you know, we're going on 18 years now that, that they, since the Big Ten's last won a national championship. And I guess maybe that kind of feeds into the narrative that the league isn't now is not what it once was. And also, you know, I know that there was a, kind of a period there where the Big Ten ACC challenge, the Big Ten won some years, but last year thoroughly dominated by the ACC. You know, I... I don't know. I got to be honest. I mean, I've got some theories. I think that maybe the Big Ten just beats the hell out of each other in the conference season. So they get into the NCAA tournament and maybe they're not ready to win six games. But I I think there's been enough participation from the Big Ten in the Final Four. Wisconsin a few years ago, Michigan State, kind of relentlessly. Michigan has been there. Um, That You've seen, I, I think, Purdue last year. What was good enough to get there? I, I think that they've just kind of played in bad luck. Maybe I mean that's it, it's kind of preposterous given that the last national champion was 18 years ago. So that that seems like a really long, like a historic run of bad luck. Um, but I I think that some of it's just bad luck. I think some of the best basketball in the country is being played in the Big Ten. You, you don't have. Like the Big Ten to me, and and when you talk to Big Ten athletic directors or university presidents about this or a guy like Jim Delaney, you hear this quite a bit, that the Big Ten isn't just about athletics. It's also about academics. And I think that there are other conferences that kind of look the other way. And the ACC, chief among them, uh, not necessarily Duke, but certainly UNC with shadow classes and that kind of thing. Kentucky, I don't know if anybody goes to class. Maybe they do. Fans in Kentucky think that they do. So good. That's fine. Um, but I think in the Big Ten, there, there's a, uh, an academic regimen that needs to be respected that may not exist in other, uh, other conferences. Maybe that's got something to do with it, too, but it's a good question. Two final questions for you, Kent. Going back sure. to the to the eighty one team, you know, one of the challenges with these discussions about great IU teams is you really need two or three hours to, to really fully get into them and talk about all the great players. Because you know, here we've spent twenty five minutes talking, and we haven't really talked too much yet about Ray Tolbert, Randy Whitman, and Ted Kitchell. In any way you slice the top thirty players in IU basketball history, those three guys are in it, unquestionably. So, what do we need to know about those three guys? And 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 you know. For each of them, 81 might not have been their best or most prolific season, but what do we need to know about how, how they were as players and what they contributed to that title team? I think that Ray Tolbert was a, uh, he was a, a dynamic team first guy who around campus, and this was, this was kind of a different time where you saw the guys. Like I'd see Ray in dorm rooms periodically in Briscoe. You'd see Ted, you'd see Randy. They were really immersed in the fabric of the campus. And so you got to know those guys a little bit. Ray Tolbert was just a really good dude. And Ted Kitchell and Randy Whitman were insanely competitive and really good dudes. I I think that these guys just wanted, they craved winning. You talk to Ted Kitchell about like single class basketball. And the thing that he ruse with multi class basketball is that if it wasn't for try, working hard enough to try to beat Marion in the sectional, 
he doesn't think that he would have been the basketball player he was. These guys always needed and continue to need challenges ahead of them in, in order to kind of satisfy their competitiveness. I, I think that that team was insanely competitive. And, and that's, to me, Tolbert, and that's Kitchell, and that's Whitman. And, you know, it, it, it bears mention that that team in 81 wasn't some single-season anomaly. It, it would have been a really good bet that Indiana would have repeated in 82 if Isaiah stayed and if Landon hadn't been in the car wreck. And then in 83, if Ted Kitchell doesn't hurt his back, I think that IU team wins a national championship. So uh, this was, at its core, I think a team of champions, and it would be, we would look back on it, and then you look at 1980, and you look at the injury to Woodson, and all of a sudden you're putting together a swath of years where Indiana, at, at least at the beginning of the season, and, and in 82, a little bit different because of the injury uh, to Landon Turner, the catastrophic injury, and Isaiah leaving, but you could have had a run of championship seasons that would be remembered along with the very, very best that's ever played that game. That's what we need to get back to. That's what we're all hoping. We're, uh, we're back on track toward. Really? So last question for you, Kent. Take, every, take the best version of every IU team, right? every IU team that's played. Put them in a tournament. Are there any that you're taking over the 1981 team on March 30th? Um, and, and I can, uh, I'll, I'll cite a guy who's seen a lot of basketball and that's Malcolm Moran, who ru runs the sports capital journalism program down at IUPUI and has covered basketball for the New York times, Chicago Tribune and other places. And, and what he's told me is that 1981 team at the time that they played that championship game, if you took all the national champions of the last 50 years and you put them into a tournament, put them into a bracket. He thinks that 1981 team would be among the final four of that tournament. That 1981 team, I think, was a machine. When, when you watched that game against Maryland in the first round of the NCAA trial, I get goosebumps talking about it. That first round game, there were NBA guys wearing Maryland jerseys, and Indiana stomped the living hell out of them. I mean, like, took them apart. They were surgical in the way they attacked them exposed them and disposed of them it was unbelievable to watch them and it was after that game when you walked around campus it was like okay what are we going to do what do you do around here when indiana wins a national championship because there isn't anybody out there who can beat them and then you got really really lucky kentucky got beat depaul got beat depaul was ranked number one in the country with mark aguire and a bunch of other guys who were plenty capable of having long pro careers and you had wake forest who was really good that year, they were all supposed to come to Bloomington. And what, what Indiana wound up having to play in that regional final, they had to play uh, St. Joe's and UAB, and they're not exactly Kentucky and DePaul. <laughs> but then you go to the Final Four, and they beat a really good LSU team, and they beat a terrific North Carolina team. And none of those games was decided by less than 13 points. They were uh, they eviscerated opponents. They removed all hope from opponents to the point where really they were down. I think a point at halftime in that national championship game, and we were still sitting around this lounge in McNutt, uh, drinking some beers, saying, "Okay, uh, where, what do we do? We go to Showalter Fountain, and what's going to people are going to you know rip out the dolphins? Okay, <laughs> all right, that sounds fun. And then what do we do?" And, and what wound up happening was exactly that. You went to Showalter Fountain. I was standing next to the cop in charge, and I heard him say to his, his walkie-talkie, okay, I've lost all control. I'm pulling my men out. And people went to work, and they took apart the fountain. And then after that was done, everybody walked down 7th Street toward, uh, toward the square, and they were knocking over trees. Anything that wasn't bolted down. They tried to knock over They did knock over it. If it was bolted down, they tried to knock it over it. There are those like those cannons uh, at the square, at the, the courthouse. And there were like 150 guys trying to knock those things over. Well, they weighed, you know, like 10 tons. You're not going to knock them over. <laughs> but it wasn't for a lack of trying. It was complete chaos. It was uh, magical and wonderful and the happiest night I've ever seen. It was kind of like, you know, you see those pictures at the end of World War II with people around Times Square kissing each other. 
there was a lot of kissing strangers down on, uh, you know, 7th and Walnut as you walked up toward the Bluebird and up toward, you know, Oscars and the Peanut Barrel. And it was just a beautiful night and unbridled joy. And I don't think we've experienced it since. And hopefully that's coming back. You know, when, when when I hear you tell a story like that, and I love that, you know, and, and I got somewhat a taste of that when I was on campus in 2002. It wasn't the same because we didn't win at all, but that was still a magical run. You know, I want Indiana to win for a lot of reasons because, I, you know, I love Indiana and it's, you know, good for the show and I just, you know, gr- growing up a fan, all those reasons. The main reason why I want Indiana to be good and, and win national championships and compete for Final Fours is so that everybody who goes to school there gets to have one of those experiences during their four years because it stays with you forever. And like you said, it's chaotic, it's magical, it's awesome. Like, but those are things like I didn't go to school with you, but I can relate when you tell a story like that, you know, and it's kind of a, it's like a fabric that ties generations of IU fans together. So we need more of them because it's time for IU students now to have their experience like that. And I think it's coming. I, I, I love the way Archie's building this program. I like the way he's recruiting. I, I hope it continues to be Indiana-centric. It, you know what? And that's one of the things that we are as basketball fans, I, I, I think, a little bit. We're a little bit arrogant. You know, we don't just want to win. We want to win the right way. We want to win being perfectly compliant, not just compliant with NCAA rules, but respecting the spirit of the rules. We we want Indiana kids to be there. We want these guys to get degrees. We want all of these things. Because that's the way it is at Indiana, and I think that's what makes Indiana special. Well, Kent, thank you so much for coming on here, for sharing your uh, your stories, your memories of the 81 team. You can follow Kent at Ken Sterling on Twitter. Listen to his show weekdays at 3 o'clock, CBS Sports 1430 in Indianapolis. Always a pleasure chatting, Kent. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thanks, Kent. Thank you for listening to this episode of Podcast on the Brink. We always appreciate you being here. To get more from me and from Alex, visit assemblycall.com and insidethehall.com for complete coverage of Indiana University basketball. If you liked this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend or family member who loves IU basketball as much as you do. You can also support the show by leaving a rating and review on iTunes, which helps us get the word out to more IU fans like yourself. We will be back next week with a new episode. Until then, as always, go Hoosiers.